Welcome to Lecture 21 of Electrical Engineering 525. Um, let's jump right into a problem here, which will be uh, very similar, in fact, extremely similar to uh, Test 21. So the problem that we will consider is problem 8.4-4, and I'll read this to you. A linear array of three quarter wavelengths long vertical monopoles is operated against an infinite perfectly conducting ground plane. Let the element feeds be along the z-axis, the ground plane in the y-z plane, and the monopoles in the x-direction. Then the questions are, A. Design the array as a Henson Woodyard increased directivity in fire array. That is, determine the element spacings and phasings. And actually, they give you the uh, spacing right here. They tell you to take D equals 0 0.3 lambda. Part B Use the universal array factor plot for three uniformly excited elements to obtain a polar plot of the array factor for this problem. Number, uh, or part C, write the expression for the complete pattern. And then the final part is to plot the complete far field patterns in both the XZ plane and the YZ plane. So first of all, let's draw a picture to make sure we understand exactly what this problem is talking about. Here we have the three monopoles. They are pointing, as you can see, in the x direction. The feeds for these monopoles are indeed along the z axis. And here we, although it's not really shown, uh, we have um, ground plane in the y z plane. That's where, that's the location, as this note says. That's location of the perfect conductor. And these monopoles have a separation of 0 0.3 lambda, and each one is a quarter wavelength long, as you can see here, uh, 0 0.25 lambda. Now, this is a problem that is um, uh, one that we've, it is similar to the ones we've seen before um, in that since there is a an infinite conducting uh, an infinite perfectly conducting plane here we can use image theory to simplify this problem if we're interested only in finding the fields above the ground plane we know of course that the fields below the ground plane would be zero so um, this uh, direction then says use image theory to convert this problem to this. And so you can see that we have the images of each one of those monopoles uh, shown now below the YZ plane, and now the YZ plane itself is empty. There's no longer a ground plane there. Since each one of the original monopoles had a length of a quarter of a wavelength, now each one of these resulting dipoles will have a length of half a wavelength. Uh, we note that these dipoles are not collinear. That is, they do the the dipoles themselves do not lie along the same line. Their their feeds do, but not the dipoles themselves. In fact, this is what your book refers to as parallel dipoles. Now, as we noted in lecture twenty, for an element when we're talking about uh, an array of elements, if the element consists of a half wavelength dipole parallel to the x-axis, which in fact is the case uh, here, our elements, each one of these could be considered as a single one of the elements, and it is a uh, half wave dipole parallel to the x-axis. So for an element consisting of a half wavelength dipole parallel to the x-axis, the element pattern is GA of theta phi equals cosine of pi over 2 sine theta cosine phi 
divided by the square root of 1 minus sine squared theta cosine squared phi. So that's our ALMA pattern. Now we're ready to proceed with the rest of this problem. Now uh, part A, remember, let's uh, refresh our memory. Part A says design the array as a Hansen Woodyard increased directivity in fire array. Now we're already given the spacing d equals 0 0.3 lambda. So all we have to do uh, for part A is to verify that that spacing uh, is acceptable because remember that one of the Hansen Woodyard conditions does uh, concern the spacing and then also um, if, if that spacing is acceptable then we need to find the corresponding value of alpha so let's check that the Hansen Woodyard condition on the spacing is that the spacing must be less than lambda over 2 times uh, the quantity 1 minus 1 over n where n is the number of elements in the array well in this case then uh, remember we're told to use d equals 0 0.3 lambda so the question becomes then, is 0 0.3 lambda less than lambda over 2 times the quantity 1 minus 1 over 3? Because we have three elements here. Well, lambda over 2 times 1 minus 1 over 3 becomes lambda over 2 times 2 thirds, which is lambda over 3, which is 0 0.33 repeating lambda. And, uh, of course, uh, 0 0.3 lambda is indeed less than 0 0.33 repeating lambda, so this uh, D that we've been told to use for this problem is indeed acceptable. So we give a check mark there. Now we need to find alpha using the second of the uh, Hansen Woodyard conditions. And that condition says that we should choose alpha to be equal to plus or minus the quantity beta D plus pi over N where we should choose the top sign if theta naught is equal to 180 degrees and the bottom sign if theta naught is equal to zero degrees. Well, beta is 2 pi over lambda, and now we're told that d is uh, 0 0.3 lambda, th uh, n is 3, so uh, this is just a matter of uh, plugging in some numbers, and uh, when we do, we get alpha equals plus or minus 0. 933 pi and again we choose the upper sign if we want theta naught to be 180 degrees and the lower sign if we want theta naught to be zero degrees let's go ahead and agree to choose theta naught equals 180 degrees for this problem so therefore we should choose alpha equals positive 0 0.933 pi now uh, we want to look at problem b and remember this said, use the universal ray factor plot for three uniformly excited elements to obtain a polar plot of the array factor for this problem. Okay, well then, let's come down here to B. The, remember that the, we will um, plot the universal array factor from alpha minus beta d to alpha plus beta d. Now, we have uh, calculated that alpha is equal to 0 0.933 pi, and beta d, uh, using 0 0.3 lambda for d, beta d will be 0 0.6 pi. So alpha minus beta d will be 0 0.333 pi, alpha plus beta d will be 1.533 pi. So, um, at a minimum, what we will want to do is to plot f of c, which is that universal array factor, for the range uh, 0 0.333 pi, less than or equal to c, less than or equal to 1.533 pi. Uh, so, just to make life easier for ourselves, let's go ahead uh, and plot it from 0 to 2 pi that's easy to do and that will include the desired range. So now we have uh, decided over what range we want to plot f. Now let's remind ourselves of exactly what f is. That u f is what they're recalling, they're referring to as the universal array factor and the formula for that that we've seen before is sine of n c over 2 divided by n sine c over 2 
in this case n is equal to 3 so we get sine of 3 c over 2 divided by 3 sine of c over 2 uh, we ask ourselves in the range uh, of 0 less than or equal to c less than or equal to 2 pi where does this go to 0 and uh, the answer then is that we want to consider the values uh, for 3c over 2 that's the term the the argument of the sine term in the numerator we want that to be equal to n pi where we don't want to consider 0 for n and we also don't want to consider capital n for n but we we want to consider all integer values of n between 0 and capital N. So in this case then we want all possible values for little n between 0 and 3 which means 1 and 2. Well when little n is equal to 1 uh, this would give us 3 c over 2 is equal to 1 pi which says c equals 2 pi over 3 or if little n is equal to 2 then that would give us c equals 4 pi over 3. So c these two values of c, that c equals 2 pi over 3 and c equals 4 pi over 3, those are the values, the only values of c in the region between 0 and 2 pi where f will be equal to 0. So now we can get a good idea of what the plot will look like. This is for our universal array factor f of c. And um, let me here put c and here is f of c and then once we have that we're ready to plot the polar plot now remember uh, alpha minus beta d in this case was 0 0.333 pi or pi over 3 which is right here right in the middle between 0 and 2 pi over 3 and then alpha plus beta d would be 1.5333 pi which is going to be roughly here so we draw a vertical line here and a vertical line here and um, if we if we extrapolate this vertical line we see that the magnitude of f there is is this value so that tells us how far we come out over here at uh, theta equals zero degrees remember this is the positive z axis in this direction so this corresponds to zero degrees and this direction corresponds to 180 degrees so at zero degrees um, this is our magnitude and over here at 180 degrees this is our magnitude so you can see how we come out here and then at these two angles uh, we have zeros and um, then here um, we 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 come down here. This is uh, this is right in this is at pi, where uh, this lobe would have a peak, so right here. And this shows us the figure uh, that we would have. This is the polar once again. This is the polar plot of f of c. <coughs> And um, what, as was the case in our previous problem we did, we see that this polar plot do, does not th this um, it does not ever have a value as large as one. So this is one of those cases where we need to renormalize, and that simply means take the maximum value which is right here, it's f of theta naught, which in this case is f of 180 degrees, and divide everything by that value so that this will become 1. So uh, that's what we're saying here to renormalize. First find f max. f max is f at theta equals theta naught, which in this case is, uh, remember that c is equal to beta d cosine theta plus alpha, so when theta is equal to theta naught, c is equal to beta d cosine theta naught plus alpha. And so plugging in the values, we get f of 0 0.333 pi, which when we substitute into the formula for f, we get 2 thirds. 
So F max is equal to two thirds. And therefore the renormalized F is equal to the original or unnormalized F divided by two thirds, which is to say it's the same thing as 1.5 times the unnormalized F or 1.45 times, uh, well, is, we'll just say 1.5 times the unnormalized F. So the renormalized F is one and a half times this expression right here. And now if we drop that uh, subscript, we get this expression for F of C. It's equal to sine of three C over two divided by two sine of C over two. And that two is coming in from this 1.5 canceling with three to give us two. So now this again is the array factor as we have already said since the element uh, the elements in this case are uh, half wavelength dipoles parallel to the x-axis and so this again remember is the uh, element factor so when we multiply the element factor times the uh, pattern factor this results in our complete pattern so here uh, in part C is the expression for the complete pattern and now uh, part D the final part of this problem uh, remember requested that we plot the complete pattern in the XZ plane and also in the YZ plane well uh, the first thing I'd like you to remember is that F which is right here that's this part this is a function of theta alone so it will be the same in the XZ plane as in the YZ plane now let's consider GA of theta and phi that's the first part here okay well um, GA of theta and phi is this part right here and we see that in the XZ plane in other words when phi is equal to zero this becomes GA of theta and phi is equal to cosine of pi over 2 sine theta divided by the square root of 1 minus sine squared theta which of course is the square root of cosine squared theta which will give us cosine theta so uh, in the plane phi equals 0 degrees or 0 radians either one we get we have this for the element pattern but notice that in the plane phi equals pi over 2 well uh, this will be 0 up here uh, cosine of pi over 2 is 0 so we have cosine of 0 which is 1 and down here uh, this is 0 so 1 minus 0 is 1 so we just have 1 over 1 we get GA of theta phi equals 1 so what that means is that the element pattern is isotropic in the YZ plane okay so now we're ready to finish this problem in the XZ plane if we plot our uh, no, keep in mind this looks just like the universal polar plot we had before except that now I'm talking about this plot um, right here it looks just like this except that now uh, we've divided everything by two-thirds and so that's why now um, it looks like this so here is our uh, pattern in the uh, XZ plane this is the uh, ray pattern in the XZ plane and here's the element pattern in the XZ plane and so here is the complete pattern in the XZ plane there's one point here that I want to uh, make sure is clear remember that alpha the, the remember the center of the polar plot is at alpha and alpha remember is at 0.933 pi so um, this line right here if if it is the cent if we take well let's say okay this was this this line is supposed to be through the center of the polar plot 
So, and, and I tried to suggest that. I, I mentioned earlier, I said the, uh, and I think I might have misspoken. This is not at pi here. This is at 0 0.933 pi. So this, this point is just a little bit to the left of the center. The, the peak of this lobe here is at uh, pi, but alpha down here is at, uh, the, the center of the circle is at 0 0.933 pi. as a result of that uh, actually this figure will look just very slightly different here so let's make sure it's, everything is clear the, the uh, peak is going to be just a little bit to the right of uh, the center Therefore, uh, this lobe will actually be a little larger than this one. So we have this is a, 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 a bit better picture of what the complete pattern will look like in the XZ plane. And then for the pattern in the YZ plane, uh, that one is, is much easier because remember the element pattern is one, it's isotropic in the YZ plane, so the complete pattern in the YZ plane will look just like the array uh, pattern shown here in the XZ plane because remember the array pattern in the XZ plane is the same as the array pattern in the YZ plane so um, as is explained here the, the complete pattern will look exactly the same as this polar plot of F of theta shown right here so that's how we uh, do the four parts of this problem and uh, once again uh, test 21 uh, will be very similar to that. So uh, that concludes uh, uh, lecture 21, and uh, good luck.